you know what the first thing you think when you get in here is? Bin. Not that sort of bin though. This sort of bin. Bins. Now you might think that I'm damning the Kia e Nero here with fame praise by going straight in with storage bins, but I'm really not. These spaces down here typify just how well thought out this car actually is. In most cars, these holes feel like an afterthought, but in here, they're front and center, literally. So let's make like Captain Jean-Luc Kirk and go into deep space. Captain's log, stardate 8169.7. The Enterprise has just discovered a strange new planet. So, deep spaces all the way through the centre console, including this one with retractable cup holders. Sizable ones. Also, you can hide your phone under here, and it might charge wirelessly there, assuming you have the right spec car, and also the right spec phone. The glove box is decent too, although the door bins are a bit shallow. Now at the back, there's an okay amount of leg room, but not quite as much as you might think, to be honest. It's okay for kids though, and the boot more than makes up for it. You see, at 451 litres, it is sizable, and although it does have a slight wheel arch encroachment issue, as you can see, the floor is impressively flush. There's also underfloor storage for your charging cables and, intriguingly, it's bigger than the boot that you get in the other Neros. Uh -huh. Because the other Neros are either hybrids or plug-in hybrids, they've got more gubbins to fit into the chassis. Ergo, the E-Nero here, which just has an electric motor at the front and a battery pack running across the floor, has the biggest boot by some distance. So it's practical then. Not the most capacious or flexible family crossover on the market, but definitely enough to be a main car for most families and with especially impressive cabin storage. Top bins. Hey, Jimmy's gone. He's gone. <laughs> And that would make this a pretty easy car to recommend, assuming the pricing and spec were okay. Which there is. There is very much. So Kia is one of the very few manufacturers that swerves the temptation to give its trim levels arbitrary and frankly baffling names. Yep, I'm looking at you, Nissan. And instead, it just uses plain old numbers. So the e Nero here starts with a number two. And there is a lot of equipment being dumped into this particular Kia, let me tell you. But the main thing to know about this particular spec is that it comes with a smaller battery and a lower powered electric motor as standard. So if you want your electric Kia to have maximum range or maximum quickness, you're going to have to drop a deuce and go up the range. <laughs> the two powertrains look like this. Now they're the headline figures, but Kia claims that its electric drivetrain is particularly efficient, exemplified by its rating in the city section of the WLTP test, that's the low speed section. In that, the 100 kilowatt version managed 250 miles, and the higher powered 150 kilowatt version, it mustered 380. Wow. Either way, it has a combined charging system as standard, which means that either version can charge at speeds of up to 100 kilowatts. That's very fast. And the top spec 4 Plus model gets 11 kilowatt onboard charging too. But if you're just plugging your e Nero into a 7 kilowatt wall box, which you probably are, it's going to take about 9 hours to charge up. But I think the more important thing about this, beyond how long it takes to get charged into the battery, is actually how much thought Kia has put into making sure the charge goes back out of the battery as slowly as possible. Some of the stuff is fairly standard. Low rolling resistance tires, blanked off aerodynamic grill, decelerative brake energy recapture, and also it's got paddles so that you can change the strength of the brake energy recapture as well. The left one and it gets stronger, click the right one and it gets weaker to the point where there is none. But also the battery has a heating system to bring it up to optimal operation temperature quickly and it's also water cooled. In other words, it's operating at its most efficient for most of the time. And the eco mode, it doesn't just make the steering a bit lighter and desensitize the throttle a little bit, although it does do that, it actually lowers the amount of available torque and power. And there is also a driving style display which tells you how economical or normal or dynamic your particular style is based on a percentage and the idea is that you want the highest percentage to be economical. Unless you're just a total maverick who doesn't play by the rules. Kia probably calls it gamification but that's a horrendous word so I'm not going to say it. There's even a button that you can press that just gets the aircon working on the driver's side, which saves power. And top spec versions get a heat pump that captures energy lost as heat and uses it to heat the cabin up. It's kind of like free central heating. 
that you have to pay for as an option. That should be in all the cars, really, shouldn't it? It shouldn't just be a top spec thing. It is pretty cool, though. Not literally. All of this helps make the Kia e Miro, well, the bigger battery one at least, a particularly anxiety-free electric car ownership experience. There aren't that many cars this side of a Tesla that have this sort of battery range at the moment. The e Nero is even a little bit better than the Hyundai Kona Electric, which it shares a chassis and a powertrain with. And you'll notice that it's a lot better than the upper level Nissan Leaf, even though the batteries are roughly the same size and the Leaf is a smaller car. Now I know that all these cars aren't strict class rivals, right? They're not exactly like for like, but in this nascent electric car landscape, class rivalries are kind of less important than just whether you want an electric car or not. And assuming you do, then this is definitely one of the easiest ones to live with. The ease of ownership extends to the way it drives. Because from here, at most speeds, it largely feels like the most refined mid-level crossover SUV imaginable. In fact, that quality is really what makes the E-Nero here ascend from just being an easy to justify car into being an actually enjoyable one. Now it's not enjoyable to drive, at all. In fact, the chassis is pretty woolly and it feels more awkward than Meghan Markle bumping into Piers Morgan at the co-op. Low rolling resistance tyres are not really made for lateral grip by nature and there's loads of body roll and actually, you know what, let's not get into this. If you're expecting that sort of feel and enjoyment from your E-Nero, then you're barking up the wrong SUV. Thing is, it also has a bit of a ride quality problem as well. It's a thing that a lot of electric cars have because there is this issue of a big heavy lump of metal sat in the middle of the car between the axles. The and so the engineers have to find this balance of stiffening the springs to cope with the sheer weight of what's pushing down on the floor, but then adjusting the damping so that driving the car doesn't feel like being sat on top of a speed bag. Now to be fair, Kia has dealt with it okay. The compromise is not too bad at all. Especially considering that this particular lump is the weight of an actual Renault Twizy. That's right, 450 kilogram battery pack this has. It's just that there is always this slightly contradictory feeling of the body control not being that good. There's quite a lot of body movement, but also this underlying judder. So the car's quite easily wobbled, but it's also quite harsh underneath you. Thing is though, that's really the only thing that bursts the refinement bubble in here, because everything else really is the most cautious, rigorous, proper, excellent experience you could want. Indeed it is, partly because it just feels like a whole lot of very high quality crossover. Especially if you get the higher powered, bigger batteried one. Because not only does it have Tesla-esque range, it's also peak Kia in the sense that what it's missing in badge prestige, which is a thing as much as we don't really like to admit it, you more than make up for with kit and perceived quality. So this here is a 4 plus top spec, and yeah, it's expensive, right? It's a 40 grand car, basically. But some of the stuff it has is proper luxury car standard. Heated rear seats, quicker charging facility, and one of the most base happy stereos you will ever find in any car anywhere. Honestly, get a bit of slip knock going in here, turn it up, and you will feel like you're about to summon Satan himself, or whoever your particular pantomime villain happens to be. And that's where the value thing comes in, because you'll find that leasing a top spec one of these will cost you many, many pounds less than leasing a basic Tesla Model 3. On that basis, it's just massively alluring. Now I know, I know, a Tesla is a Tesla, right? And saying that does kind of feel like saying that you should buy Primark trousers instead of Gucci ones, because the Primark ones have got more pockets. But the point is that if you want your electric car to be as normal as possible, in fact, better than normal, because it's really good in most ways, like I keep saying, there is very little road noise here, for instance, and that is a thing that's exacerbated in electric cars because it's not generally drowned out by the sound of an internal combustion motor. So that's a really impressive thing about this car. It's also got lovely light steering. It feels very easy to park and manoeuvre. The visibility all the way around is really good. It's got a split C pillar, which means that you don't get that massive blind spot that you can get with these SUV type things. You sit high so you can see well, but there's enough headroom. It's just a very genuinely enjoyable and relaxing thing to be in. So you add that to its good range, its reasonable price, masses of equipment, no matter where you buy it in the range, and its highly functional cabin. And you can't help but conclude that this is just 
bang on the Bunsen. Bunsen burner. Bunsen burner, nice little earner. Well, it is a thing that functional is the best way of describing the cabin. It doesn't have the Tesla's clean, high-tech aesthetic or the Polestar 2's sense of utter depth of quality, or the Honda E's eclectic mix of the past and the future. Well, it does have that, but it just doesn't work quite as well in here. You see, Kia really has nailed its exterior designs now, right? That's mainly because it's had this guy in charge for the last 15 years, and he was responsible for the Audi TT, among other things, the original one, the groundbreaking one. But Kia's interiors have still got a whiff of the 1990s about them somehow. And never bad, right? And this is not bad at all, but it's just a bit too much dark plastic, a few too many buttons. And so in here in particular, it's a bit of an odd mix because you've got that, but then you've got these futuristic bits sort of shoehorned in almost. You've got this digital instrument panel and the widescreen. And most of all, this rotary gear selector. And this in particular is really futuristic, but in context, it's incongruous, yeah? It's like that time someone left their Starbucks cup on the set of Game of Thrones. It does feel nice to use though, the dial. It feels hefty and cool at the same time. And generally the cabin's just really inoffensive, yeah? There are a lot of people who will definitely prefer this sense of button-led normality as opposed to jabbing at a massive touchscreen constantly. It's also a bit nicer looking and feeling than a Hyundai Kona inside too. It just goes about being a comfortable, easy to use crossover in pretty much every way. All the stuff I said before, refined, good visibility, ergonomically, it's fantastic. And then you add to that the innate responsiveness of an electric drivetrain, and it really does pick up this thing. Hey! <laughs> the front tires do tend to struggle a bit, if you're a bit heavy-handed or footed with the throttle. It's just all as easy to live with as electric cars today come. One of those cars that feels much better than the sum of its parts. If you got a football reference, it's Thomas Gravison. Everyone, including me, we were, I have to be honest, we were surprised when we heard that you were going to Real Madrid. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's never gonna stand out. It's a bit awkward looking. Doesn't always seem that comfortable. Definitely not as exotic as its peers, but it's extremely effective and dependable and should not be underrated. Also, very safe. Now what I would say is that if you want a car that kind of looks like this and has this sort of space and you're not as bothered about the range, then the MG ZS EV might be a better choice for you because it's much better value than this or it's cheaper than this anyway. That's definitely worth a look, yeah? But me, if I was in that boat, I'd probably just take a number two, a Nero number two. And we will end it there, I think. Thank you very much for watching. Totally appreciate your time. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do that. Please go to vanorama.com for amazing lease deals on this or anything else. I love lamp. Bye.